And so the final speaker this evening is the General Secretary of the Socialist Party, Peter Taff. I, with a lot of other comrades who are here tonight, have been active in the workers' movement, in militant, and in the Socialist Party for longer than I care to remember. In that period, we scored some splendid victories, such as the victory of our comrades in Liverpool against the Thatcher government. We followed that up with the immortal struggle in the poll tax itself. And I have to say to you here tonight, if I was to give up some of that, those victories in the past, to participate in the movement to come, I would. Because we've had a glimpse, and only a glimpse, in the colossal movement in Greece, in the splendid movement of the Spanish workers, in Portugal and above all, as Alec has marvellously demonstrated in the developments in South Africa. But even these events, I would say particularly to the young people who are gathered here tonight, will pale beside the grandiose movement that is going to take place in the next period of months and of years. And how can we be sure of this? Because on the one side we say, capitalism <coughs> is coming apart at the seams throughout the world. You know, just after the crisis of 2007-2008, the Queen was at a meeting, the monarch was at a meeting in the LSSC, and she said to the gathering of economists there, why did nobody see this coming? <laughs> Now that's a very bad imitation of the Queen. Well, we saw what was coming. And moreover, the soothsayers, the witch doctors of capitalism, did not have a clue about what was coming down the road and which confronts their system today. In fact, one of their number, a guy called David Blanchflower, said, to be brutally honest, quote, and here I quote, in many ways, we would have been better off to hire a monkey to throw darts at a dartboard. <laughs> That's capitalist science for you. It says everything about the blind character of capitalism and their witch doctors. And there's worse to come. Cameron has said that this crisis will last for at least a decade. The Resolution Foundation says you will have continual falling living standards, not just of the unemployed, but of the so-called working poor. The middle will be squeezed. In fact, if you look at the actions of the government, it looks as though Cameron and Osborne and the rest of the crew have conclu concluded that they're going to be defeated at the time of the general election. And much better <coughs> to carry through a massive programme of privatisation and then set in place a situation by creating facts on the ground that the Miliband government will be incapable of confronting and overturning. They're selling everything which is not nailed down. They're even selling Scotland Yard. It gives a new meaning to a yard sale to the process of privatisation. A scorched earth policy is taking place at the present time. And in the unions we see the attack on facility time. In some of the schools in London, the unions are almost operating in a clandestine fashion, having meetings outside the schools. That's the character of the period that we're in. <coughs> in the wake of this, there will be mass poverty. We see that in the real hunger now that is developing in the inner cities of Britain of the mother and child who died in Westminster recently, where millions of tons of food go into landfills. It shows the character of capitalism, a system based upon production for profit and not for social need. It pays them to destroy food, 
so long as their profits are held up. One of my daughters said to me recently, <clears throat> I listen to what you're saying, but I find that there's a certain outrage fatigue now at the policies of the coalition government. It's as if the ruling class wants to create a mood of impotence amongst working people. Nothing can be done. Some workers hope that the storm will pass them by and the situation prior to the crisis will be restored. That will not happen because the hurricane that we see in World Capitalist Crisis is much more powerful than the hurricane Sandy we've seen in America in the last week or so. The capitalists are terrified of the situation that is developing. I had this brought home to me in a meeting I did in the Oxford Union in the earlier part of this year. And one of the theoreticians of Thatcherism, a man called Madsen Pilly, with emphasis on the mad, by the way, with the policies that he enunciated in this meeting. And he said, in the course of this discussion, he said, I go to bed every night dreaming about the advantages of capitalism. I can think of other things to dream of at night. And we said to him, you're not having dreams. You're having nightmares. In fact, we are your worst nightmare. You're the author of the poll tax which you sold to Thatcher. We're the people who buried the poll tax in the course of that mass movement. And we made the point of that meeting that if you look at capitalism today, it's betraying its mission. It's incapable of taking society forward. That is summed up by the £750 billion pounds which is in the banks in Britain at the present time. Why aren't they investing? Because it does not pay them to invest. Why are they carrying through a mass privatisation programme? Because that's the only way that the surplus of funds that they have can be put to productive use in the next period. The fact that it destroys lives, the fact that it destroys communities is neither here nor there. It's a product of the crisis of capitalism itself. And when it comes, for instance, to the deficit, which justifies the cuts that are being carried out, we read, didn't we, in The Guardian last week, that the richest 1,000 people increased their wealth. It's not their wealth. They increased their wealth by 150 five billion pounds since the crisis started. The deficit is 119 billion pounds. You could cancel the deficit. The reason for the cut overnight by a wealth tax on the, on the rich at this particular moment in time. And when Cameron talks about the recovery and weighs the statistics, in the House of Commons last week, of a 1% growth in the last quarter, it's a mirage. It will not happen. Of course, there is no final crisis of capitalism unless the working class removes this system from the scene of history. A certain equilibrium could develop out of this crisis, an unstable equilibrium, but that would be on the basis of the bonds of the working class, of the destruction of living standards, of a curtailment at least of the rights of working class people as a whole. You know, if you think about it, and it's been emphasized in some of the speeches from this platform today, if you think about it, the only people who have confidence in the capitalist is Ed Miliband and the front bench of New Labour. He talks about a responsible capitalism. There is no such a thing. He spoke in a vacuous speech at the Labour Party conference about one nation invoking the writings allegedly of Disraeli. Disraeli spoke about two, two nations. By the way, the Labour front bench had just been awarded one million pounds by a special fund in the House of Commons, and that one million pounds is given to any party that has two MPs that can think of ideas for a manifesto. So if we get back into Parliament with Teddy Fields, Pat Wall and Dave Nellis, we would have got the million pounds to just thinking up a manifesto. It doesn't matter what you say, just so long as you have a million, you have a, a manifesto, you can get a million pounds as a result of this. Will the working class tolerate these attacks on their rights and conditions? Absolutely not. 
Leave aside the 20 general strikes in Greece, the fresh lessons from Portugal, which is absolutely crucial for us to understand what is possible. The government in Portugal thought the Portuguese workers were docile. They then attacked the living standards of working class people, a savage attack, and they thought they would get away with it. One million people in 40 cities rose in an uprising and the government retreated. Of course, they'll come back. That's inevitable on the basis of capitalism. No victory can be maintained so long as the system continues. For that matter, even a defeat is not a permanent feature under capitalism. We can do the same as the Portuguese workers. That's the lesson of the speeches from this platform here tonight. In 1972, when the dockers were imprisoned, the Pentonville dockers, a movement developed from below that was moving towards a general strike. Then the general secretary of the TUC, a man that's not familiar to most of the younger generations here today, Vic Feather. By the way, he makes Brendan Barber look like a Bolshevik in comparison. He was so right wing. He threatened the government with the general strike on that occasion. He only did this because he'd already been informed that the doctors were about to be re released by the equivalent of Widow Twanky, the official solicitor of the government himself, themselves. Even partial action from below and the threat of a mass strike forced the government to somersault. Even a one-day, partial one-day strike in Britain, they're determined to try and avoid that because it sets a benchmark, it sets a precedent for the British working class. Even the most brutal and seemingly determined government, government can be compelled to step by step back if the working class and the labour movement uses its effective power. This is what a one day general strike actually means. And there's a decision of the Trade Union Congress. That decision would not have been possible without the pressure of the National Shop Stewards Network in conjunction with the RMT and the left trade, union, left trade unions in Britain. It's necessary to coordinate massive combined action of the six million trade unions or stand aside. That's how posed is the situation in Britain today. You know, Alec referred to South Africa. I went to South Africa in the early 90s. I may even go with him in the next period to participate in a crucial congress of those miners that he spoke about. But I remember graphically the discussion I had at the time of my visit. And we were discussing the position in South Africa with the marvellous example of general strikes and the level of consciousness, by the way, of the South African working class. And in one of these discussions, this worker said, well, what's the position in Britain? And I said, well, we stand for combined action. We stand possibly even then for a one-day general strike. Well, why don't you have a one-day general strike, he said, this worker. I said, well, the TUC are preventing it. What do you mean? Well, they're right-wing and they're trying to prevent it. He thought for a moment and said, well, why don't you kill them? <laughs> I said, like, we don't do things exactly like that. In Britain at this stage, we just try and remove them. But you know, in that statement, and what Alec has said is a very important warning to the right wing of the trade union movement in Britain. The laws of the class struggle don't stop at the shores of South Africa. We have a movement there to overthrow a rotten leadership. And I have to say, we've participated in the creation of that leadership in the past. I discussed with James Montalisi, one of the organizers of the NUM in the underground. We gave him ideas of how the NUM could develop. That man, to my disgust, is sitting on the board of one of the biggest mining industry, mining companies in South Africa, of gold fields. It shows how a workers' organisation, even the best when it begins, can be corrupted if it doesn't stay separate and apart from the capitalist state itself. If it doesn't elect its officials and subject them to recall. If those workers don't live on the wage of an ordinary worker, corruption and bureaucratism is inevitable. 
And that is a warning to the trade union leaders here. Do you think that a mass uprising to overthrow trade union leaders is just applicable to South Africa? It can happen here if you don't. don't reflect the will of working class people. And as to the law, this is not an insurmountable obstacle. The battle of the poll tax showed that. When 18 million people said we're not paying, that was the end of the poll tax. Law is only applicable when it's, if you like, acquiesced to in a social sense as a whole. We demand the whole situation demands in Britain at least a one-day strike. It will draw behind it all the oppressed, the youth that Claire spelt out and explained in her tremendous contribution here today. It will mobilise sections of the middle class. 30 shops a day are closing each day in Britain at the moment. 1,000 shops have closed in the course of the last six months. There's an avalanche of redundancies worldwide. 200 million are unemployed at the present time. That's 30 million than before the crisis began. And the International Labour Organization says there will be an additional four to five, maybe seven million in the course of 2007. The legal profession of 2013, rather. The legal profession is up in uproar. I read an article the other day in which a lawyer pointed out that Cameron could not give an interpretation or could not translate the Magna Carta. He knows all about the Magna Carta coming from Eton, as Claire pointed out. But what this government is doing is attacking some of the rights enshrined in Magna Carta and in the law going back for a thousand years. The middle class are in uproar. The situation is such that when we raise the question of a one-day general strike, sections of the working class say, why not go the whole way? If we come out, we should stay out. We understand these set set sentiments, but it would be mistaken. A one-day general strike is preparatory. Imagine if everything stops on one day. The factories close. The workplaces become silent. Transport stops, apart from the RMT, ferrying people to the national demonstrations that will be taking place. The whole of Britain comes to a halt. What a marvellous demonstration that will be for the first time demonstrating the power of the working class itself. That's particularly important given the last 20 years. An all-out general strike poses the question of power. Sometimes an all-out general strike can be provoked by the representatives of the ruling class itself. That's what happened to some extent in 1926 when Baldwin, the Tory leader at that time, partially provoked a general strike in order to inflict a defeat on the working class. By the way, he was taken aback because the general strike began to get out of control and grew with every day. But before we have an all-out general strike, we need, we need a preparation, we need organisation, we need working people to be given the lessons driven home in the course of that strike. Also important in this new period that's opening up, and it's linked to the question of industrial action, is the crying need for a new mass party of the working class. And in a certain sense, this is the question of questions in the working class movement of Britain, and to some extent internationally. Why is it that the South African workers went on strike wanted to overthrow their leadership and at the same time oppose the question of a new mass workers party because they see instinctively the limits of industrial action alone. They see the battle taking place on the political plane as well. And we agree with Lenny McCluskey when he said at the time of the Labour Party conference, the Labour Party has no God-given right to exist. The Labour Party can exist only if it is the voice of ordinary working people, and in particular of organised labour. Lenny, it's no longer the voice of ordinary working class people. Alice Mark Mahan, who was an ex-Labour MP, was more correct when she left the Labour Party and said, new Labour is unreformable. I've just read 
the diaries of Tony Bennett. And in that, he makes a crushing point against his own point of view. When he says in the course of this diary, he spoke to a Tory, Uncle Tony, who said he was at a party for Thatcher, and when he asked Thatcher, what is your greatest achievement? The reply of Thatcher was, New Labour. We knew that. The expulsion of us in the 1980s was part of the preparation of destroying a political point of reference for the British working class. Jack Straw, you may remember him, the older generation. The new generation, you don't know him. He played a vicious role in expelling Tony Mulhern and our comrades in Liverpool. Now he says, as a result of his experiences in Liverpool, the militant tendency are responsible for him going deaf. <laughs> says he's suffering from depression. Now we have great sympathy with people suffering from depression. And he says as a result of the militant tendency, he now suffers from imposter syndrome. <laughs> yes, Jack, you are an imposter. You pretend to be a socialist and you weren't. You pretend to be a democrat and you weren't in expelling our comrades in Liverpool. Five million voters and workers in Britain have abandoned the Labour Party. Osborne was booed at the Olympics. Why? Absolutely correctly so. Half a million disabled people will suffer as a result of the measures that he's introduced. But also, let us not forget, Ed Miliband was also booed on October 20th at the mass demonstration. That represents a conscious conclusion by many working people. Incredibly, there was a member of UNITE at that meeting was overheard saying, why are they booing? Which world is he living in? Which tower is he, is he existing in? Working people are sick to the back teeth of the idea that we vote Labour and the problems of the working class will be solved. Inherent in reformism is betrayal. In fact, we would go further than that. We find at the tops of the Labour Party not reformism, but of counter-reformism. We don't believe in insults, even to our opponents. It's a question of explaining. If you remain within the framework of the system, you can weep and cry and wring your hands, but you'll carry out the bidding of big business. Did anybody see the marvellous documentary on Stoke on Thursday night? Of a Labour council, I couldn't make out who was the Labour representative closing old people's homes. The man who was doing it was the leader. He's on 44,000 pounds. That's a fortune in a poor city like Stoke. To expect him to represent working people, forget about it. You know, we had, even in this government, an ex-Labour representative, Alan Milburn, who said the coalition made a mistake in abolishing the EMA. Who created the conditions for this government to attack the EMA. You did by introducing tuition fees when you were in power. Who created the conditions for attacking the, a, the, the, the NHS? You did as a result of the policies that you've carried through. On one basis alone, the need for a new mass party is justified. Not a big party to begin with, but a small party. And that is, these people will be forced to look over their shoulder. They will be impervious to petitions. They will not respond to the weeping and the wailing of the old who are put out of their the old people's homes, or the cuts, or the sacking of 600 people, for instance, in Waltham Forest recently. They will be impervious to that. But you stand against them, you threaten them with electoral, if you like, revenge, it's a different ball game entirely. We should launch a new mass workers' party. Tusk is the best hope for working people in this situation. It's a great step forward that the PCS has decided to set up a political fund, but they should be energetically involved now in TUSH, in creating in all the unions supporters for TUSH. We should stand in the widest possible way in all the elections to create the basis for a new party. If we do that, we will be facing the future in a serious way. There's no other force capable of doing this. Respect is no alternative. It was a scandalous decision 
For instance, if they expect to go ahead and stand in Manchester without consultation with fellow socialists in that area, it seems that George Galloway seems to be more predisposed to rub shoulders today with Nazarbayev, the dictator of Kazakhstan, the oppressor of the people of Kazakhstan, than he is to discuss with fellow, fellow socialists a programme for going forward. Hand in hand with this goes the need everywhere now to raise the question of an alternative socialist program. Capitalism is already bankrupt and will be seen as such more and more by workers in the period that we go into. Revolution is knocking at the door of history. Socialism is coming back, it's rolling back. I have here the quote of a Greek worker from the Guardian of last week who was involved in one of the big demonstrations, he says. I'm amazed there's not been a revolution already in Greece. So are we. But no party as yet has got a clear, clear programme for revolution. Syriza offers the best hope, but it's still a bit cloudy. We demand in Greece the cancellation of the debt, nationalisation of the banks, then make an appeal to the Spanish, to the Portuguese, to even the French workers that will be moving into action in the next period. We demand coordinated action. Yes, we accept what Pro Pro said. We will be prepared to be patient in the first months of 2007. If we don't do this, then capitalism will take its revenge. Already, Golden Dawn has gone from about 0.7% in the elections in Greece to now almost 25% to 14% rather at this moment in time. It's no bigger, really, the threat of fascism in Britain or other countries in Europe, it's no bigger than the size of a, of a cloud, of a man's fist on the horizon. But if the labour movement fails, they do pose a threat. If not from them, then more serious forces of the right. Unfortunately, our experiences in London is that the other organisations on the left, such as the SWB, has played a scandalous role in Waltham Forest in providing platforms for local right-wing councillors of Labour who are carrying through the cuts that are creating the conditions for the rise of the British equivalent of Golden Dawn, and then preventing our speakers from appearing on the platform. This is a bankrupt policy, and we will fight it every inch of the way. The same applies to the question of demonstrations and so on. And my last point is this, Congress. Break with capitalism in Europe and the world. That needs a resolute party. We call for all comrades here to join the Socialist Party, to recruit your friends, your family, like Bob Pro recruits Millwall supporters from his fair family, or for the demonstration. Recruit them to the Socialist Party. We, we stand for a change in society, for a fundamental change based upon workers' democracy. And a mass party, which we will provide a Marxist spine of that programme. The movement towards socialism is shown by the South African workers, the Greek workers, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the British workers will take their place in that movement in the next period. What is the alternative to this? It's catastrophe economically and socially. The working class will not accept this. We're confident of that, nor will the youth. They will struggle, and that's the basis of all life. So forward to a one-day general strike. Forward to the building of a mass party of the working class. Forward to the enunciation of a socialist policy within all the organisations of the working class. Prepare the force that this time, in the 21st century, will arm the working class with a programme to take power and establish socialism in your lifetime.